In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of Amen. Uh, okay, so today, today's feast, uh, the apparitions at Lourdes. So this is, I don't know, kind of interesting. Uh, this is the feast of the apparition at Lourdes, um, and we're going to hear about St. Bernadette Subaru, because in, on the traditional calendar, she doesn't have a feast day assigned. So um, her, her, her feast day in the, in the, um, the Novus calendar is April 16th, uh, but this year that's um, Holy Saturday. So we're going to hear about Bernadette Subaru today. So these apparitions at Lourdes, um, they, they began today, 11 February 1858, and uh, they occurred to Bernadette Subaru. She was poor and ignorant and not even really that pious. She was 14 years old uh, at this time, 1858, born to a peasant family, and they had a pretty rough life. She, they lived in what used to be a jail. That was actually a dungeon. Like there was a section of the jail that was underground and like with these, you know, windows. That's, that's where she lived. Uh, it was, there was a run, one room house and she lived there with her mom and dad and her eight siblings. So, you know, imagine that. They, they got used to sharing. So uh, this one day, right, she, she, she um, is out with her sister and her friend and they're in a forest collecting firewood next to the river and she had the first of her apparitions. Thursday, 11 February, 1858. She heard a wind blowing, uh, but did nothing seem to be moving. And then she heard it again, and she saw a shining light from a small grotto. And then she sees what she describes as a small young lady wearing a white dress, a blue girdle with a yellow rose on each foot. The lady invited her to pray the rosary with her. So that was the first of the apparitions. Um, rather remarkable, but she didn't tell anybody. Uh, and three days later, uh, those same three girls were again in the same place, and she has a second vision. Now, this time, her friends, uh, her sister and her friend, noticed something, and I guess she may have said something to them a little bit later. So they, these, these other two girls decide they're going to investigate this strange phenomena. So um, her sister has a bottle of holy water, and she sprinkles it around. Uh, and then the, uh, the other friend uh, throws a rock into the grotto where this vision is supposed to be taking place because, of course, th these two other girls can't see. Only Bernadette can see the, uh, the Blessed Virgin. And uh, so her friend throws this rock, and then the, the, our Blessed Lady disappears, and it was, you know, kind of a little more remarkable than last time. So Bernadette was not, didn't want to tell anybody about it, but her sister told her mother. And Bernadette tried to explain, I saw this lady, etc., and the result was that everybody got a spanking. So stop making up stories. Yeah, you, you, you bratty little kid. Yeah. So, um, you know, and sorry, that's what parents are supposed to do. Like, kids tell lies. And I mean, how many ten thousands of kids have made up some weird stories that deserve a spanking? And then just so happens the one, her story was real. Oh, well. Uh, you know, my mom actually used to do that. She would spank us for something and we'd find out later it wasn't our fault. And then she'd say, well, you probably got away with something earlier. And it was hard, it was hard to argue because it was true, so. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> she, uh, she gets a spanking, right? But again, uh, she has another vision. And this is, um, let's see, that was the 11th, uh, 14th, and now the 18th. So this is a vision on the 18th of February, and this is a Sunday. And Our Lady tells Bernadette uh, uh, that she wants her to return every single day for two weeks. She's going to appear to her every day for two weeks. And this is also on the 18th of February, so this is the third vision, and uh, Our Lady tells Bernadette, uh, this is very interesting, she could not promise her happiness in this life, but only in the next. That's one of the, one of the um, uh, important messages from uh, these visions. Now, th these visions are remarkable. This series of visions for two weeks are, are very remarkable, precisely because they are unremarkable. Nothing happened in these visions. There was no extraordinary revelations like the secret, you know, at Fatima, Portugal. There were no dire messages for mankind, no revelations, no secrets, no predictions. Our Lady simply asked St. Bernadette to pray for poor sinners, to do penance. And sometimes she said nothing at all, but just prayed the rosary. And that was it. Um, the, the one remarkable thing uh, occurred on the 25th of February. So this is eight days into her request. She's been coming there every, every day. And now this is the eighth day she's been coming. And Our Lady asks Bernadette to drink and bathe from the spring. If anybody's seen that old 1950s movie, you remember her dig digging in the dirt and, you know, washing in the muddy waters. So there, there was no spring. 
drink from the spring and eat from the herbs of the ground. And they're like, what are you talking about? So Bernadette, um, this is the beauty of simplicity. Bernadette herself said that she was like, she was ignorant and stupid and she wasn't kidding, right? Uh, but she was honest and she was humble. A humble person is an honest person and an honest person accepts reality for what it is. Uh, this is, this is going to be proof. This is why um, Bernadette was chosen. Uh, be, not because she was so holy, but because she was so honest and simple. And so our lady says, drink from the spring and eat of the herbs. And so she's like, well, I don't see anything, so I guess I'll dig until I find one. And then, you know, eat this little plant here that looks like it to me. Didn't care. I don't care how he looked. People are laughing at me. So what? I'm just doing what our lady told me to do. Laugh if you want. So that, that's the simplicity. That's the beauty. So this, 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 I mean, now this is remarkable. She digs in the ground, right? And they find this muddy little whatever. And then the next day, the water is running clear. And then the next day, there's more water and more water and more. And then it's this torrent that we, we have today, the Lord's water. Um, that can't happen from a little girl digging in the ground, right? If that much water is under pressure, it's going to have come out before that. So that, that's miraculous, that, that spring having appeared. Um, and uh, so she continues. Uh, she finishes out the, 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 the two weeks. Nothing other remarkable happens. The next apparition wasn't until March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation. And uh, so our, our Bernadette again is at, goes to the grotto. It's March 25th. Uh, and Our Lady appears and she answers Bernadette's request. And she, got, she asked her too, who are you? Right at the end of the two weeks, who are you? And Our Lady tells her, come back on the 25th and I'll tell you. So Bernadette goes back and she says, who are you? I am the Immaculate Conception. Right? Not, I am the Blessed Virgin, I am the Mother of God, I am the Immaculate Conception. And um, this was truly remarkable because uh, this had never before occurred in any other apparition. People have been having Mary in apparitions for centuries, but she never uh, called herself the Immaculate Conception, as far as I know. Why not? Because it hadn't been declared dogma. Four years previous, it was on 8 December 1854, Pius IX wrote the encyclical Ineffabilis Deus, stating that it was incontrovertible fact, he defined, declared, and decreed uh, the Blessed Virgin's Immaculate Conception. Four years later, he gets a vision, you know, Bernadette gets a vision from our Blessed Lady, and she says, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now, what this is, what this shows is that the papacy and the Pope, when infallible declarations are made, they are not decisions, they are recognitions. The Pope was recognizing, he's like, I'm not declaring this, or I'm not deciding that this is going to be true, I'm recognizing that it's true, and I'm simply announcing it. This is true now, it always has been true, and it's just that, that now is the time to declare it a fact. No more discussion, no more disagreement about the Blessed Virgin's Immaculate Conception, it is incontrovertibly true. Uh, and and this, this, was, this would be important for later on in 1870 when they're investigating uh, papal infallibility. 1870 at Vatican I. That's when the, it was declared and recognized when the Pope makes a decision, it is infallible. And it's going to be exactly precisely things like this. The Pope made an infallible declaration. Uh, it was ratified by heaven. Heaven itself uh, testified to the, what the truth of what the Pope had said. So uh, th th this is more important perhaps than we realize for, for that. Um, and it wasn't what the Pope thought or what the Pope, even what the Pope said, it was the infallible declaration he, he declared. It was that uh, the decision on faith and morals. So uh, that was March 25th. Uh, there would only be one more apparition and that would be on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July 16th. And that was the final apparition to Bernadette Subaru. And then uh, that was it. Um, nothing more after that. No more visions, no more nothing. Um, and by this time, July 16th, uh, the, the grotto had been barricaded by local authorities. And Bernadette was going there and kneeling down. People were going there praying the rosary. So our Blessed Virgin wasn't appearing all these times, but everybody was going there to pray. And so, of course, authorities didn't like that. It was barricaded, but uh, St. Bernadette knelt down and said Our Lady had never been so beautiful. And then that was it. No more apparitions. And um, she lived a very simple life after that. She became a nun and lived out the rest of her days in anonymity. Um, she joined the Sisters of Charity in 1866. So she, would have, she was uh, 22 years old. And she, she joined, by the way, when she joined this convent, 
she joined with 42 other postulants. 42, right, uh, in one year. Um, you have convents, they won't get, they won't get two in 40 years. <laughs> so, um, so they served the poor and the sick in a hospice in that town, and she spent the rest of her life there, working in the infirmary. She worked as a sacristan, she did embroidery for sacred vestments, and her fellow nuns admired her for her humility and spirit of sacrifice. Once she was asked by another nun, uh, do you have temptations of pride because she was favored by the Blessed Mother? Here's where hum her, her humility and honesty come in. How can I, she said, the Blessed Virgin chose me only because I was the most ignorant. Uh, and on another occasion, somebody asked her again about the apparitions, and she said, the Blessed Virgin used me as a broom to remove the dust. When the work is done, the broom is put behind the door, and you don't need it again. So very, very simple, very straightforward. I'm nobody special, and that's precisely why I got chosen, because I'm nobody, right? I'm not going to be tempted to pride, because what have I got to be proud about? Um, and there's another famous quote of hers from 1870, when the Prussian armies were marching towards Paris. This, by the way, 1870, the Prussian army was attacking. That's what interrupted Vatican I, was because uh, the, the Vatican, the, the Europe was under siege. Um, that's why we had Vatican II, which was the continuation of Vatican I from 1870. Um, and by the way, you may know um, Pius X and Benedict the Fifteenth were warned not to call Vatican II because modernists were trying to hijack, would hijack it. They were warned. Yeah, Pius X, Pius X in the 19, 1910s, Benedict the Fifteenth in the 1920s, they warned them, do not call Vatican II, it will be hijacked. And then it was called by John the Twenty-Third, and I'll let you figure it out for yourself. Anyways. A famous quote of hers from 1870, Prussian armies were advancing towards Paris. She was worked in a hospital, and there was danger they might be overtaken by the enemy. And a visitor there at the time asked her, uh, did you receive in the Grotto of Lourdes, or after that, any revelations related to the future and the fate of France? No. Did the Blessed Virgin give you any warnings for France, any threats? No. Right, the person's trying to figure out, are we gonna get overtaken? Right, did you get any warnings, any threats? What's gonna happen? I'm trying to tell the future. She says, um, the Prussians are at our gates. Does that not cause you any fear? No. There's nothing to fear then? I only fear bad Catholics. All right, that, that was her famous quote, bad Catholics. Look around you today. I would rather we had Prussians at the gates, you know, than bad Catholics that are filling the church. That is the worst thing. The worst, the worst danger is, is bad Catholics. So uh, 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 St. Bernadette eventually contracts tuberculosis, and she died after several years of increasing pain and illness. She was 35 years old, and she died on April 16th, 1879, and that was Easter Wednesday that year. She was canonized by Pius XI on December 8, 1933. So a number of messages to take away from these apparitions at Lourdes. Uh, the first of all being, as I said, the ratification of heaven, of the Pope's declaration of uh, infallible, infallibility. Um, the second is, is the, um, the connection between the Immaculate Conception and healing. Remember that, that spring at Lourdes sprung up. Um, there's a team of medical doctors at Lourdes, and they investigate all the claims of people who were healed. And there, are, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of claims. You go there and you can see all the canes and the crutches and everything people leave there. Catholic, you know, a, a mix of Catholic doctors declare that there are 70. 70 miracles that, that science cannot explain. And there's one really, um, a, this atheistic doctor who does not want to believe in miracles is forced to admit there are eight. There are eight that he can't explain. That's an atheist. So even people that don't want to believe are forced to admit there are miracles occurring from this, this spring. So, um, but you have this miraculous healing from the spring, and what was, who was the cause of it? Our Lady, I am the Immaculate Conception. How does that relate to, to healing of illnesses and disease? All illness, all disease, all evil comes from original sin. That's why there's disease, that's why there's sickness, that's why there's cancer, that's why there's all these disorders in the world is because of original sin. Had Adam and Eve not sinned, there would be no sickness, no disease, no death. So how fitting that the one lady who doesn't have original sin is also the source of healing, right, from the effects of original sin. So there's a connection we should remember. Uh, but ultimately, I would say the most practical lesson for us is uh, Our Lady's words, I cannot promise you happiness in this life, 
only in the next. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't physical healing we should seek as much as it is spiritual healing. Forget about my crippled legs or my cancer or this or that. What about the cancer of pride or avarice or envy or greed or lust or whatever it may be? Those are the sicknesses from which we should beg our lady to be healed. And look at St. Bernadette. St. Bernadette is a, is a fantastic example. She got sick. She got tuberculosis. That's an incredibly painful disease to die from. And so she herself, who was involved, she, she um, dug this miraculous spring that was curing all kinds of people, but not her. Bernadette Subaru was not cured, uh, uh, even though she herself was in, involved in the cure of so many others. So that, that is just such a great lesson. Um, and you know, I may not, my life may not be, quote, happy in this world, uh, but it will be happy in the next. And, and that's why. How can we have happiness in the midst of this world? By living in the next. If we live in the next world, if we live for God, if we live that, that supernatural life, we will be happy in the midst of this world. Right? That's really the key. That's really the message. Uh, so let us pray to God for that detachment, for that obedience, for that surrender to his will, for that healing of our soul, and, and pray to Bernadette that we might live like she did, not worried about happiness in this life, only happiness in the next. God bless you all. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, no.